Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Plotlines. I'm your host, Connor. And before we start our episode, please like, share, comment, and, and subscribe if you want to support us here. And uh, the guest today is the one, the only, Charles Coulomb. Welcome, Charles. Thank you for having me back, Connor. T today is part two of your history of who is Charles Coulomb. Uh, oh. Are you ready for that? Well, I've been avoiding it my whole life, but I suppose it has to, every run of luck has to come to an end sooner or later. <laughs> well, no, uh, well, what can I say? Uh, you had, you had uh, spoken, we, we touched before the show on uh, my education, such as it was. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that's, um, it certainly helped make me what I am. There's no doubt about that. So I was, um, first schooled at uh, dear old blessed sacrament in hollywood california uh a jesuit parish oh no in 1966 probably wasn't and, too scary at that point well let's just say it was a lone liberal island in a, what was then an orthodox archdiocese oh okay so even then it was bad uh, oh you don't know and <laughs> to teach me the beloved ihms the Immaculate Heart of Mary. But not uh, not Jesuits? No, they weren't teaching us in uh, elementary school. Oh, okay. Uh, we, had, we had the Dear Sisters. And of course, oh. uh, starting school in 66, 67 was fine. 67, 68 was my second grade. And in the summer between first and second grade, while I was busy teaching myself to read, uh, and I, I really had to, my reading was terrible. And part of the problem that I faced at home was that my father subscribed to American Heritage. And when one of those things would come in, he and my mother and brother would discuss it around the dinner table. But I couldn't really read it, so I couldn't get it on the deal. That was annoying. So I resolved I was really going to learn how to read that summer. Mm -hmm. I started out with comic books. And to this day, the comics of the Silver Age have a, uh, a deep sentimentality for me. Is that like uh, Jay Garrig? Is that the Flash? Or is the, that no? The, oh, no, Barry Allen. That's the Golden Age. Wait, I don't know. Explain to me. Um, who was the Flash back then? You know, I used to know all these names like they were my own, and they're, they've kind of vanished. But it was, it was Superman and Batman were my tops, of course. But ah. Green Lantern, The Flash, uh, all those was, guys. Was it um, was The Flash wearing a helmet or not? Because if he, then I can tell you that. No, he didn't. He had a, a red uh, a red jumpsuit that covered his head with these okay. wings. He didn't. The guy in the Golden Age had like a Mercury helmet. Right, yeah. So that so Jay Garrig is the silver, or is the golden. Barry Allen is the silver. Okay. All right, there we go. So see, the the nerd in you has been brought out. I'm, I'm glad to have demonstrated <laughs> for all the same. Yep. Uh, Green Lantern, uh, Green Arrow, Hawkman, Aquaman, uh, the Justice League of America, the uh, the Legion of Superheroes, but in addition to those uh, wonderful uh, then modern stuff. There were also my dad's secret stash of 1950s EC comics. EC. Tales from the Crypt and things like that. Really what's awful e stuff. What's EC mean? Uh, I don't know. Something comic, ever ready comic. I don't know. Okay. But they, uh, they had been banned in the late 50s for being too graphic and gruesome and awful. Yikes. But I love them. <laughs> so there you go. You, you love end, what's banned. Yep. Yeah. Well, what are you going to do? But by the end of the summer, I was reading American Heritage. So wow. that was a, a big thing. And having acquired a real skill at reading, I figured second grade was going to be much easier. <laughs> because while I was closeted <laughs> with Tales from the Crypt, and the uh, Justice League of America, the Dear Sisters were out in Santa Barbara 
with Carl Rogers. Who's he? A psychologist who helped them get in touch with themselves. (laughs) So they decided at the majority that it was time to get rid of the habit, the rule, and everything else. And that became a very famous fight uh, at that time. We live next door to the convent, so we noticed them going up to Hollywood Boulevard in lay clothing early on. But they were still coming to school in the habit. And then there was a, a big fight, and they got rid of the habit. And let's just say, without going into details, let's just say that those who they knew did not favor the change, uh, our lives became very unpleasant. And it's something I've never forgotten. It was my introduction, if you will, really and truly to the great Catholic Civil War of our time. Yeah. Well, uh, we moved out to the San Fernando Valley. In 1968, nine, and I did third grade and fourth grade and fifth grade in public school. And to show you what public school was like back then, we had Christmas pageants. <laughs> yeah, I figured that was that would scare you. Yeah, it's pretty awful stuff. It'd be da- it'd be if that existed today, I would be scared of what it would look like. Because well, if it did exist, I mean, it would only exist in a mockery sense. Well, ours had to be sort of quasi-interfaith, so we did have a Hanukkah song, which I learned, haven't forgotten. Hanukkah, Hanukkah, I'll give you a treat. Dry idols to play with and latkes to eat. I remember that. Uh, but we sang, the rest of it was a combination of uh, Christmas, uh, you know, real Christmas songs, like the first Noel and We Three Kings, and uh, Red, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and Frosty the Snowman. So it was a, a balance of, of both the religious and secular, uh, religious and secular, uh, um, I can't say hymns, carols, music, whatever. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, then, uh, my dad's fortunes having somewhat recouped, uh, I went to a Catholic school for a year, Guardian Angel in Pacoima. And Guardian Angel was an interesting school because it was primarily black. I was one of the very, very few white kids there. And that in itself was a great lesson, taught me a lot. If I had ever been inclined toward white guilt on the one hand, or thinking all people are the same on the other, I would have been cured by that. (laughs) Uh, Because what I found is that uh, the black kids were a lot like the white kids, (laughs) only uh, prejudiced. (laughs) A lot of them. There was what they called Patty Day, which was the day on which uh, the Patty being the name for white people, uh, in which white kids were supposed to be beaten up. Yikes. Well, I was the only white kid that went to school that day, and I wasn't touched. Why? Well, they said it was because I was French. So, <laughs> really? Mm-hmm. So the uh, it, wait, why would the kids make that kind of thought process? Well, you got to remember that most of them being black Catholics, uh, uh, yeah. a lot of black Catholics have connections to Louisiana. Okay, that yeah, that's kind of what know, I was. Thinking. Part French themselves. So, being it's one of the few times in my life being French brought me anything <laughs> other than opprobrium and the uh, dislike of President Bush Jr. When did Bre- Bu- uh, George Bush uh, Jr. Yeah, Jr. Uh, well, because dislike. the French wouldn't go into Iraq and Afghanistan with us. So, oh. we called them surrender monkeys and Renamed French fries, freedom fries. <laughs> kind of like Woodrow Wilson renaming uh, uh, sauerkraut Liberty Cabbage. Uh, but... I was thinking, I was thinking Europe. Woodrow no, Wilson, because no. well, Woodrow Wilson uh, basically changed all of Europe because he just wanted to. Well, he did, but during during the war, he he changed the name of sauerkraut. And it became <laughs> Liberty Cabbage, the way President Bush changed French fries to freedom fries. And did any of them stick? No, it 
try not to make sense out of our masters, just obey and, and don't notice there's an issue. But at any rate, uh, so that was that was sixth grade. However, there was one other important and interesting thing about sixth grade, and that is that my sixth grade teacher was, a, a, at the time, a very young man. He's still alive. I was, I was still in touch with him. But he was a very, very young fellow from Buffalo, uh, New York. And he introduced us to C.S. Lewis and the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, which on my own would later introduce me to uh, Tolkien and, and all the rest of it. Yeah. Uh, I know all that to sixth grade. He also took us on field trips to places like the Huntington Library and the LA County Arboretum, which remain among my favorite places today. Yeah. Anyhow, um, and of course, living in San Fernando Valley, as we were at that point, at least once a year, you had to go to Mission San Fernando because even, and this had been true when I was in public school because, uh, you know, that was the, the root of California, whether you liked it or not. Anyhow, um, we then, dad's fortunes having taken another turn downward, we moved back into town. And I got to spend two glorious years at Virgil Junior High. Now, Virgil was an interesting place. It was at the border of several different gangs, so everybody was ganged up. It was mostly Mexican and black, with a few Asians and a very few whites. Um, but I, uh, after some initial problems, I got along there pretty well. No, I didn't join 18th Street or the Crips. Uh, <laughs> thanks for asking. But uh, I, did, I did find a way to deal uh, with the situation. And I learned about gang life. I learned how to read uh, cholo writing. And a lot of other interesting skills that uh, most white brats don't get. How's that helping you these days? Well, whatever I write, I uh, leave cholo writing graffiti on walls here in Austria. It leaves people kind of wondering what it's all about, but I don't <laughs> care. I mean, I uh, I make a point of leaving uh, Canton, 18th Street, and Rebel 13 uh, gang tats all over the place. That leaves people wondering what it could all mean. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm doing it in honor of, of, of something or other, mostly other. At the same time, of course, uh, when, when I was in sixth grade, uh, I joined the Boy Scouts, having been a Cub Scout previously. And I have to say that Boy Scouting was a big, big part of my life. Uh, I'm an eagle. And, uh, you know, I love the program as it was. And, of course, as with so much else in modern life, I uh, dislike very much what it's become. Mm -hmm. yeah. But no one listens to old people. So, unless uh, they're uh, ruling the country. Well, yeah. Then they lick their boots and ask for more. So, uh, from Virgil Junior High, uh, I went on to Daniel Murphy. And there I learned what Catholic high school should not be if you want your kids to be Catholic. Uh, and this continued uh, with our moving up to uh, back into the valley. Two glorious years at Bishop Alamany High. Um, again, uh, a religion program designed to help you out of the church. And fortunately for me, all through my schooling, my dad had gone through our books and uh, told us what was wrong and what was right. And when I was at Murphy, I acquired a, um, a confessor by accident, uh, James Francis Cardinal McIntyre. Accidental. It, no, I it know. Was, it was great. And uh, at that time, thanks to his direction, I discovered the then Romeward bound Anglo Catholics at St. Mary of the Angels, and through them, the Russian Catholics at St. Andrews del Segundo. There were no Latin masses or anything like that around at the time. Yeah. There's none that I had access to. I assume he would have celebrated them. Though. I'm sorry? I assume he would have celebrated some. The, or... the Cardinal? Yeah. Well, he did, but you got to bear in mind that they were at a side altar every, early every morning. Uh, totally quiet. Totally. What's that? You can go? I, or... could, I could go, and I did go a number of times. Oh, okay. But... Word from our affiliate, Bishop Sheen Rosaries. You've probably worn through the chain of your cheap plastic rosary. 
Other rosaries simply can't stand up to the wear and tear of everyday life. Bishop Sheen rosaries are made of solid metal beads and paracord to withstand any condition and are backed with a lifetime warranty. Upgrade your rosary to a Bishop Sheen rosary made to fit your lifestyle or buy one for a friend. Each rosary sold supplies two weeks of food for a school kid in Uganda. You use the exclusive link down below to help support our efforts here at Plotlines. The link will take you to sheenrosaries.com. Be sure to use the code PLOTLINES10. There's a world of difference between, as I say, the sort of low mass that he would do and the, uh, the way a parish mass should be. And that was one reason why he sent me off to St. Mary's to see how it should be done. Was he unable to do a high mass? Because, uh, well, yeah. I mean, yeah, he's okay. totally unable to do. Uh, I mean, he was allowed to do a private Tridentine mass, he couldn't even give out communion. Interesting, really. Okay, uh, and that was just by according to the Vatican. Well, according to what people thought the Vatican said, okay, but that's what as I'm we, saying. As, well, as we know from Benedict the 16th, the Vatican was lying. Because no. it was never suppressed. At least no, well, what... yes and no. Yeah, okay. Imagine a creature with two mouths yapping out of each side. Imagine a creature who lies for a living. Such a creature probably was working in the Congregation of Divine Worship, which mm-hmm. in 1974 issued a note forbidding the use of the old missile. It was an unsigned note. Now, mind you, this was ultra vires, so much so that the cleric who came up with it should have had ultra vires stamped on his rear and his forehead and buried with it. Maybe he is. You don't know that. Well, it could be. That could be his his current uh, eternal location having to deal with that. I don't know. (laughs) But what I do know is that on the basis of that note, hundreds if not thousands of clerical careers were destroyed across the world. Yeah. And when Benedict issued Sumorum Pontificum, bear in mind what he was actually doing. It was really quite skillful, and a smart person would have appreciated it. What he was trying to do was to remove the in horrible injustice crying to heaven for vengeance without punishing the malefactors. Yeah. And if you're interested in unity, that's a smart move. Now, of course, with trash can custodians and uh, dominatrix dominavi, the Holy Father of today <laughs> has reduced us to the pre Samorum Pontificum uh, situation. It's yeah. as though he wants the malefactors to be punished, and he wants the sin to continue to cry out to heaven for vengeance. Would, wouldn't it be non malefactors punished? I'm sorry, big pardon? Wouldn't it be the non-malefactors punished or what he well, the, sees? Well, the, them too, yes. Okay. But I mean, uh, uh, Benedict's whole reason for doing it as he did was to avoid future opprobrium for the malefactors. Mm-hmm. And now that's been torn away and we have to look at the entire disgusting spectacle on its own its own delicious lights. Yeah. You know, it's it's rather... It's rather as though the Holy Father Benedict had put a bathrobe around the uh, the Madam of the Bordello, and uh, Pope Francis has insisted that she take it off and display her somewhat somewhat tattered wares. Uh, yeah, yeah. What but, appropriate? Um, what? It's appropriate. I don't actually know what that word means, unfortunately. Uh, see, that, that comes to going to Catholic schools, see? <laughs> and public schools, every school. I did both. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you, they were pretty appropriate. <laughs> anyway. I don't know what that means still, but okay. Look it up. I'm not going to help. I will eventually. I'm uh, not going to do your own homework. What do I look like? Some sort of refugee from the PTA? I don't think so. Do it yourself. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> let's get back to you. Oh, let's get, well. Let's get, let, that's enough of you, my work. Let's talk become, about me. 
How'd you become a writer? That's what I want to know. Ah, uh, well, that that happened by accident, actually. Uh, like everything else of, of any use in my life. Uh, well, first and foremost, let me say that uh, when I left Bishop Alamany, I went for two glorious years to a military junior college in Roswell, New Mexico, called New Mexico Military Institute. And I'm very, very glad I went there. It was a, a horrible and a wonderful place all at the same time. But many of my dearest friends today, I made there then, and I learned how to write there. I learned my trade. Little did I know. Yeah, you didn't know it was your trade. I didn't know it was my trade, but it was. So uh, two years there, two years at Cal State Northridge, which was um, a little bit like daycare with booze. I like to say that I uh, minored in poli sci and majored in frat life. <laughs> uh, and I, I did a number frat. Of, yeah I can't imagine that to be honest well don't know who don't sorry to shock you but it's true were you uh, uh, smoking a cigar and enlightening the uh, masses I was I was in fact uh, except that I'm fatter and have grayer hair I'm told I haven't changed much but <laughs> I'm not the best judge uh, what, what I will say, however, is that uh, years ago, the I won't say which frat I belonged to for the sake of uh, whatever, but um, years ago, a kid who only knew me through my writing had started college, and he wanted to know if he should rush a frat, and I said, well, I was a member of it, and I, I told him the name, and his response was, uh, well, they have a house here, I'll rush them. And I said, okay, you do that. So he did. And he calls me the following Monday. He said, gee, Mr. Colomb, they must have changed a lot since your day. I said, oh, why did he say that? He said, well, nothing but a bunch of empty-headed booze hounds. And I said, well, yeah, that's pretty much what I remember. <laughs> you know, uh, and not that being an empty-headed booze hound is a bad thing. And it certainly is a lot better than most of the people we have running us in church and state. So, you know. Always, always look at the bright side of anything. Could be worse. They could be a lot worse. And I, and I had a good time. I mean, I, I learned between the strictures of the Institute and the ease of Cal State Northridge, I picked up another important trade. I learned how to enjoy myself. I learned how to make the best out of any bad situation. Now, mind uh -huh. you, I'd had a lot of pre-training, thanks to my dad and so on. I, I mean, in his general attitude and so on, because mm -hmm. he learned that trick during World War II. I thought you were to... going to say networking. I'm sorry? I thought you were going to say networking. Um... No, 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 no. Well, that too. I mean, I did learn. I did learn the what we called it at NEMI, the bro system. <laughs> I learned that very, very well. And it's that too has stood me in good stead. Um, I... I learned I mean, one of the things that's interesting about a place like the Institute is that they do teach you more than they intend to. Uh, they certainly teach you how the world really works, how people really are. Sometimes very good and very noble and sometimes incredibly wretched and sometimes the same person. <laughs> and that that's the great mystery of humanity. Yeah. And then, of course, when you realize that about your fellow man, then comes the terrible realization that, yeah, it's you too. <laughs> and that, Not that's an me. important one. Yes, indeed. A big part of adulthood is realizing that I myself could be the bad guy. And that's something I'm afraid that people today very often never do learn. Yeah. It's always everybody else that did it. I'm, of course, pure and wonderful. Yeah, well. <laughs> I'm sure we could find someone who would testify to the opposite. Yeah. But no. unfortunately, yeah, fortunately, none of us are on trial here, so case dismissed for one of evidence. <laughs> Anyhow, so uh yeah, so uh I did various things that were kind of amusing. Uh but I finally fell into comedy. And for a few years, I performed on the Sunset Strip and elsewhere. But then I made the mistake of writing a book. 
<laughs> you made the mistake I of did. writing a book. I did. I did indeed. Which one? All by my little self. Well, what happened was that I went to a, a, a reunion and I realized from Alamany and I realized that the vast majority of my uh, classmates no longer went to mass. And I knew why they didn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I began writing what was intended as a letter to my class and which turned into a book. And it was huge. And I didn't know what to do with it. Or I didn't think about doing anything with it. But then a group of laity were forming a publishing house uh, in the LA area. I heard about it. I was told they wanted something different. And I thought, oh, I got that for them, all right. <laughs> so not thinking they'd publish it, they did. I gave it to them and they read it. They loved it. They published it. Well, then uh, it got several very nice reviews, but the one that really made it, a, in Catholic terms, something of a bestseller was Gary Potter's review of The Wanderer. Wait, so, but which book is it? I'm sorry? Which book? Oh, What's Every your first Man Today book? Call Rome, which was okay. originally E.T. Call Rome, but they, they feared the wrath of Spielberg, so <laughs> they expanded it. And it, it did very, very well. Uh, then people began asking me to do articles and give lectures and so on. And finally, I had to decide between writing and comedy and writing one. The, uh, my first journalist job was with the uh, the old National Catholic Register when it was in LA, run by Mr. Frawley. And um, my first gig for them was doing film reviews, of all things. Uh, and I have been, that was back in 89, I guess. And I have been a, uh, a full-time writer ever since. Yeah. What about like journalism you've done more journalism as well well alongside uh, um i've done both uh, alongside sure i uh, because when you're a freelance writer and you write to eat you really have to generate a lot of stuff you really really have to because you've got to eat and that means you write as much as you can you write for anybody who'll take you uh so long as they'll pay yeah, you know, when that, was hmm? when when was the first time you sort of irritated the clergy with your writing? With when haven't I? Uh, well, what was the? I guess when we did you know you were? When was the first time you knew you were irritating the clergy, or just the oh. hierarchy or the powers that be, whomever they are? When the my first when my first book came out and. uh you know, I, uh, review copies were sent to America and Commonweal and so on, and they refused to um, they refused to write reviews. But I started hearing whispers from uh, people that various clerics who had looked at it were really annoyed with it. <laughs> and my response then, down to the present, whenever people would come up with this stuff, is uh, it's very simple. Am I lying or am I telling the truth? If I'm lying, shut me down. If I'm telling the truth, though, oh, yeah, there's a real problem, all right, but it's not me. Yeah. And that, you know, that was just the, the, way, it, the way it always was, the way it's always been. I, um, you know, I, I really can't tell you the number of times down through the years that I've had uh, priests jump on me, nor the number of times I've answered them with just that. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, I understand. You don't like it. That's too bad. But is it true? What's their and response? Then, none. Just <laughs> nasty looks. I mean, one, uh, when I was writing for the LA Mission, for many years, and I was going to interview a, uh, a priest. He said, uh, "The LA Mission, uh, you've, uh, you, it's kind of a, a right-wing paper, isn't it?" And I said, "What do you mean right-wing?" 
What, what does that mean? Well, it's very negative. I said, well, we when things are good, we write about good things. When they're bad, we write about bad things. Unless, of course, Father, you're telling me that we should be silent in the face of evil. If you want to tell me that, I'll make sure to remember that you told me that. And he said, maybe we just better get on with the interview. And I said, okay. <laughs> I've never heard of left-wing uh, media being uh, positive. <laughs> remember, the only truly unbiased individual is someone who agrees completely with you. Oh, perfect. See? <laughs> no, I, I mean, it's, it's all such guff. But they're, mm-hmm. they're liars, you know. They just lie and lie and lie. When I was a kid, and they told us that the new mass was a return to an older form of mass, which was how they sold it, they were lying. Mm -hmm. When they told us that uh, the rosary and benediction and all that were for a more childlike Catholicism, we needed a more adult Catholicism, they were lying. They were lying through their little mouth mouths, little drivelous rivers poured out in endless amounts and continue to do so. Yeah. And of course, we have to pretend that uh, there's something there. But, you know, how many times, if, if, if one were honest, how many times does one hear from so many of the liberal clergy utter nonsense, just utter lies, And we have to keep a nice face and pretend that it's not an utter lie and that the emperor's new clothes are very pretty. But, you know, they may be pretty, but they're getting really threadbare. And seeing that they're non-existent, that's quite a trick. (laughs) Yeah, no, a mess is a mess, no matter what they call it. Well, indeed, and that was one of the things that from the beginning of my career as a writer, I um, I had to keep in mind. But that wasn't all. But wait, there's more. Oh, but wait, there's more. And that is, I had to balance that, both my own sanity and the sanity of my readers, with the fact that despite our best efforts as human beings to wreck everything, there's an awful lot that's still really neat in this world of ours. There's still a lot of really good stuff to be found. And that, one has to balance one's understanding of the dreck with an appreciation of, a love of, and indeed a wonder at all that is good and true and beautiful yet in this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, You know Chesterton, don't you? I know, yeah. I haven't read enough, but yeah. Well, he has a poem which, uh, for the sake of our studio audience, I'm actually going to read. Don't thank me. Uh, But it it captures the spirit of what I mean. Uh, About life in general. And about, about how the natural and the supernatural are all intermingled. It's called The Rolling English Road by G.K. Chesterton. Before the Roman came to Rye or out to Seven strode, the rolling English drunkard made the rolling English road. A reeling road, a rolling road that rambles round the shire, and after him the parson ran, the sexton and the squire. A merry road, a mazy road, and such as we did tread the night we went to Birmingham. By way of beachy head. I knew no harm of Bonaparte, and plenty of the squire, and for to fight the Frenchmen I did not much desire. But I did bash their baggonets because they came arrayed to straighten out the crooked road an English drunkard made. When you and I went down the lane with ale mugs in our hands, the night we went to Glastonbury by way of Goodwin Sands. His sins they were forgiven him, or why do flowers run behind him? and the hedges all strengthening in the sun. The wild thing went from left to right and knew not which was which, 
that the wild rose was above him when they found him in the ditch. God pardon us, nor harden us. We did not see so clear the night we went to Bannockburn by way of Brighton Pier. My friends, we will not go again or ape an ancient rage or stretch the folly of our youth to be the shame of age, but walk with clearer eyes and ears this path that wandereth and see undrugged in evening light the decent inn of death. For there is good news yet to hear and find things to be seen before we go to paradise by way of Kensal Green. Beautiful. Yeah. And that um, that reminds me, boy, I, I can't help myself. It's I guess because it's Franz Joseph's birthday or something. But it is. It is August eighteenth. Okay. But I, I'm reminded of another poem of similar length by J.R.R. Tolkien, <laughs> and it has much the same message. Now that I think of it, you're going to read that too. I am. Okay. Two bits of poetry, ladies and gentlemen, for free. <laughs> this is amazing. Read by you. Read by me, no less. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. Look at all the the uh, the the. I I, I mean, I, I I'm just shocked. Next, Absolutely you'll have to shocked. Next, What's you'll up? have to read your own poetry. Oh, I might end with that. I only have one of them memorized, so you're lucky. Oh. Uh, this is, um, I sit beside the fire and think, which it also epitomizes what I mean by the balance between what's good and what's awful and the fact that we have to keep it all in mind. And also, I have to admit, this one has the added element of age. Paradise by way of Kensal Green and the decent end of death that Chesterton spoke of. I sit beside the fire and think of all that I have seen, of meadow flowers and butterflies and summers that have been, of yellow leaves and gossamer in autumns that there were, with morning mist and silver sun and wind upon my hair. I sit beside the fire and think of how the world will be when winter comes without a spring that I shall ever see. For still there are so many things that I have never seen. In every wood, in every spring, there is a different green. I sit beside the fire and think of people long ago and people who will see a world that I shall never know. But all the while I sit and think of times that were before, I listen for returning feet and voices at the door. And that. Boy, those two poems kind of sum up my writing career. Now you know. <laughs> that was what you were thinking of when you were doing it. Well, it's, uh, it is, you see, the vocation of the writer to show the reader not just the world as it is, though he has to do that, but also the world as it could be if we live up to our best implicits yeah. um, and it is I mean it's like anything else in life it's not a major vocation like the priesthood or kingship or fatherhood nor is it ditch digging which has a place in and of itself believe me mm -hmm. but it is a sort of middling trade I think that is neither so elevated as the great things I've mentioned, nor need it be as low as prostitution. <laughs> uh, Those are your two levels. Well. Or three levels, I guess. Three. Yeah, three, three. levels. And the third level is somewhere in between. I mean, mm -hmm. writing on the one hand is in its way a sacred thing, but it's not the most sacred thing. Yeah, it's an elevated thing, but it's not the highest thing. And it is, it is definitely a thing with its own own set of requirements, its own ethos. 
And during my entire career as a writer, I've tried to the best of my ability to maintain that ethos and the, the standards, I can well say, given me both by my immediate mentors in the craft and by the writers whose work I admire. Yeah. Um, I was well, fortunate. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, like, uh, last, um, we're coming up on the end time. Um, but last uh, sort of question for you. Um, what would you say would be the highlight so far of your career? Well, I would say venerating the uh, Shrine of Blessed Kazakar would be the highlight so far. But there have been a lot of things. I mean, the Holy Grail book um, was a wonder to write, you know, especially about Eucharistic miracles and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it took me back to venerating the Holy Blood of Bruges, which I did many, many years ago, and which, um, which really stands out in my head. There's so many relics like that. I, I still am keen on venerating. I really would love to go to Valencia and venerate the Santo Caliz, which I think is the best candidate to be the Holy Grail. But of course, when you're in Europe, you could do that. It's harder in America. Yes, indeed. But yeah, well, uh, so we're coming up on the end. Any last bits that you want to mention? Any oh. plugs? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, well, uh, we're doing off the menu again. Uh, we're back in the saddle. Uh, starting in September, I'll be doing a second podcast a week uh, for Virgin Most Powerful Radio. So uh, nice. You want to go to their station? I'll be really dragged out two of them a week. Wow. Uh, yeah. Um, you can uh, catch my stuff, of course, at uh, the European Conservative, 1 Peter 5. Uh, I've got something coming out from Christchurch shortly, uh, Catholicism.org. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm seemingly all over the Internet at the moment. I, I, I'm feeling a severe case of overexposure. But, <laughs> You know, that, that's, that's something I have to leave to, to others to determine. Uh, I'm, uh, I'll be, oh, I'm doing a, uh, I'm doing a, uh, a symposium on Casa Carl in Dallas in October. Yes, indeed. Uh, I will be there as well. Yeah, yeah. So you come over and we'll, we'll finally get to meet in person. It'll be the most exciting part of my life, probably. You need to get out more. That's all I'll tell you. Agreed. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you all for watching. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. And have a wonderful day. Bye. God bless you all. Ciao.